Hello, this is Helen Morrison, and welcome to Speech Acoustics 3, Resonance, Vowels, and Diphthongs. This lecture is the third in a series of five about speech acoustics, starting with a description of complex sound that is the kind of sound that speech is, moving on to resonance. Now we're talking about vowels. The next lecture talks about consonants. And throughout all of these lectures, we'll be talking about aspects of speech acoustics as they pertain to audiometric frequencies. We'll tie that together in the final lecture along with some other applications when we talk about speech acoustics and the audiogram. These lectures are devised with professionals and students who work with children with hearing loss in mind. They are also intended for use by parents and they were put together in particular with regard with regard to the interests of professionals who are working toward listening and spoken language specialist certification, CERT AVT and CERT AV Ed. If you would like a copy of the slides for this lecture series, you can go to the Dropbox link that's on this slide or you can write me. You can also email me with questions or comments regarding the series at my email address, HelenMcMorrison at gmail.com. The topics in this lecture will include a review of vocal tract resonance, talking about vowel production and vowel acoustics. We'll talk a little bit about vowels that can potentially sound alike when one is listening with a hearing loss. And we'll summarize by talking about vowels and their acoustics and the audiometric frequencies. Now to review the previous lecture with regard to the sound source that is acted upon when sound travels through the oral tract and we create vowels. The source at the vocal folds, the voice, phonation, um, is a periodic complex sound comprised of predictable frequencies. And the series of frequencies here on this spectrum, we have frequency on the x-axis by amplitude on the y-axis. This series of frequencies exists in a very particular way. The low, each frequency in this series is a harmonic. The lowest harmonic is the first harmonic and it's what we talk about when we talk about speech acoustics as the fundamental frequency or F-O. When sound is produced at the vocal folds, the fundamental frequency is the most dominant of all the harmonics. It's the strongest. And all successive frequencies diminish across the frequency range. When sound from the vocal folds goes through the vocal tract, through the pharynx, the mouth, or in the case of nasal consonants, through the nasal cavities, that sound gets shaped through the resonant characteristics of the vocal tract. And the shaping emphasizes some of the harmonics, de-emphasizes or diminishes others of the harmonics, and so on and so forth, so that the spectrum of sound at the lips looks very different with regard to harmonic amplitudes relative to one another compared to the glottal source. Here's another graph of the spectrum of sound at the lips, in this case for the vowel AW, ah, and we have frequency by amplitude, and here are the harmonics 
all these vertical bars and we have some harmonics that are emphasized and others that are diminished and what I've done is drawn the envelope over the spectrum so I've just drawn a curve over all of these harmonics that are enhanced and diminished and the very first harmonic is the fundamental frequency this harmonic that is enhanced is known as a formant this harmonic that's enhanced is a formant and this harmonic that's enhanced is a formant now it's important to know that in this particular graph it's a single harmonic that's enhanced to create these formants these peaks in the spectrum but in other spectra that we might look at in vowel production it might be a cluster of harmonics that are enhanced within a single formant so a formant is not necessarily a single harmonic it could be a cluster of enhanced harmonics it's this enhancement that's important now the formants are also named so here we have the first three formants in the spectrum the first formant the second and the third also known as F1 F2 and F3 and these formants in particular are important in speech perception and the identification of speech sounds so to look further into what happens in the resonant chambers of the vocal tract to enhance these particular frequencies to create the harmonics it's helpful to think of the vocal tract as a tube it's a tube that's considered to be closed at one end at the vocal folds and open at the other at the lips or in the case of the nasal consonants it's open at the nose and the diameter and the length of that tube changes as we form the speech sounds um, it changes as we move the jaw up and down it changes as we move the tongue backwards and forward the length of the tube changes as we round the lips we actually lengthen that tube when we round the lips we shorten it a little bit as well when we spread the lips for example when we round the lips for ooh as opposed to when we spread the lips for e we also lengthen that too by directing sound through the nasal cavity such as we do for nasal consonants so let's just take a look at vowels in general we classify vowels in two different ways we classify vowels on the high versus low dimension these are the vowels of English high vowels being when the jaw is high up as in the case of e and the case of oo and i and u and then as the jaw starts to drop down we have the the mid vowels and then when the jaw is fully dropped we have what are known as the low vowels the a ah and a ah. And for me, the ah uh, and ah, uh, for me, my ah uh, is somewhat in the middle. So I put it right here. And I like to think of these vowels here, the e, the u, and the ah, uh, as representing extremes of this vowel quadrilateral. So one dimension of vowel articulation or vowel production is this high to low continuum. Some of you may think of these vowels with other terminology being closed versus open, where the jaw is more toward a closed posture, and the low vowel being the jaw being more open. Another dimension along which we create the vowels, along which we produce or articulate the vowels, are on the front-back dimension. So we have front vowels, along this left side, central in the middle, and then back toward the right side, E being the most extreme front vowel in English, 
and oo being the most extreme back vowel in English. And this is created by sliding the tongue, bunching the tongue and sliding it forward and back to create the different vowels. I think of it as almost like sliding the arm of a trombone. Now if you want to think about that tongue sliding forward and back, what you might do is start by saying the vowel E. Just keep, keep the position for the vowel E. And now without changing your lips, because when we make an OO, we usually round our lips, but without changing your lips, stay in the lip position for E and then slide your tongue back and you will hear the sound changing to an OO simply by moving the tongue back. So I'm going to do it. I don't have video here, but I'm going to make an E, E, and now I'm going to slide my tongue back from that position, E, U, E, U. And you can hear how it changes to what we, to our ears, recognize, through, through our auditory system, recognizes an oo simply by sliding the tongue. That's how we create and articulate vowels. So what's happening in terms of the resonant chambers, the way the sound is being shaped by moving the jaw up and down and by moving the tongue forward and back. Jaw opening, which is what we do to change vowels on the height dimension, high versus low, changes that volume of the oral cavity. It also changes the pharyngeal cavity, but we'll stick with thinking about the mouth because I think that's easier for people to visualize. Tongue position changes on the front back dimension, changes the length of the oral cavity, and E, A, and U represent the extremes of vowel production. Let's go further and think about frequencies. Remember the first, second, and third formant when we looked at the spectra of sound, the spectra of a vowel at the lips? The first formant, F1, is sensitive to changes in jaw movement with low vowels or our more open vowels, F1 is higher. Higher F1 for low vowels with our high vowels, the E and the U. F1 is lower, so the higher the vowels, the lower F1. Low vowels, higher F1. High vowels, lower F1. The second formant is sensitive to changes in tongue placement. So front vowels, E have a higher F2, E, I have higher F2, higher second formant. Back vowels have lower F2, lower second formant. And if we round our lips, everything gets a little bit lower because the entire tube is getting longer. That's a lot of information. We're going to look at this information in several different ways to help you understand and to begin to remember this information. First of all, let's stay with what we're accustomed to seeing. We just looked at the articulatory vowel quadrilateral. Now let's plot these vowels with regard to frequency values. So this horizontal or x-axis is representing the front and back dimension, just like we looked at with the articulatory vowel quadrilateral. And we have the frequencies that pertain to F2, or the second formant. So what we see here for the front vowels, we'll just use our most extreme front vowels, E and I. We have higher frequencies represented for F2, than for our back vowels, U and U, 
These are lower frequencies. We have something like 700 to 900 hertz here on this particular graph, about 2100 to 2300 hertz here for the F2. Now let's look at the high versus low dimension, which is this vertical axis, and F1 is sensitive to changes in jaw opening. And so for our high vowels, our U, U, E, and I, we have lower F1 values. Here they're sort of hanging around at 300 to 350 hertz on this graph. And then for our low vowels, our extreme, we'll say, is represented by the A, ah, we have higher F1 frequencies, 800, 850 hertz. You're going to see slightly different numbers every time you look at a graph of speech acoustics. And those numbers are going to change somewhat depending upon the speaker, because if you recall from the previous lecture, that fundamental frequency, which is the sourdough starter for everything, is going to change with speaker age and gender. Lower for adult males, the highest for children. In addition to that, these absolute values change somewhat with regard to the other speech sounds surrounding the vowels that are measured. But for our purposes, we want to understand the first formant, High vowels have lower F1, low vowels have higher F1. For the second formant, back vowels have lower F2, front vowels have higher F2. Now let's look at some speech spectrograms and the arrows on these spectrograms represent the first second, and third formant, and we have some of the vowels of English represented here. What we're going to do is just look at how these vowels change as we move, we'll start with F1, as we move from a high vowel down to a low vowel, and then back up to a high vowel. So we have F1 for E, which is a high vowel, for I, which is a high vowel, but the jaw is lowering a little bit more, E, jaw is lowering a little bit more, A, and our lowest vowel, A, and all the vowel is starting to go up a little bit, and now we have our two highest vowels, U and U. Now it's a little bit harder to see on the F1 dimension because the range of frequencies represented by F1 is, is a smaller range, but we see that um, if you just kind of sit back and look at these red lines, we see from the lowest frequency for the highest vowel, and then as we drop the jaw, we see F1 rising to its peak in A, lowest in E, peaking in A for F1, corresponding to jaw movement, and then as the jaw starts to raise back up, when we say A and U and U, F1 goes back down with the raising of the jaw. Now let's do the same thing for F2 on the front to back dimension. So now we're moving from the front vowel E back to the back vowel U. So here we have F2 for E, fairly high, over 2000 hertz, and I, we're moving the tongue a little bit further back moving the tongue even further back for E, eh, moving the tongue even further back for A, ah, moving it even further back for for A, ah, I'm sorry, moving for A ah, ah and A, ah, now to O ah and O, uh, 
and I'm going to make a break here and I'll explain this. And now for ooh. Now if you'll notice, I've made a break on these formants here, these second formants for U and U. And it's because in this speaker, as the it speaker is saying U and then slightly also for U, they're starting to release that vowel and the tongue is relaxing from being in the far back to more front and we see a little bit of a movement of the formant. But in general, we see this slide down informant value um, as we move down to u uh and u. Not quite so apparent here and I'm going to say it's an idiosyncrasy on the part of the speaker. But let's look at this again in yet another way to help you understand how F1 and F2 can be used to represent the vowels, how we perceive F1 and F2, and thinking about the audiometric frequencies. This is a fairly well-known graph that Dr. Ling and Agnes Ling created way back in 1978. There's a lot of information on this graph, and it's one that's really important for us to spend some time with. To begin with, on the bottom of this graph, Dr. Ling and, and Mrs. Ling have listed the vowels of English, and there's some idiosyncrasies that are part of their dialect that aren't in my sort of flat American dialect here, but we can learn from this. We have the back vowels here, U, U, O, O, the mid-central vowels, A, A, U, 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 A, and the front vowels, E, A, I, E. So we have the vowels arranged on this chart proceeding from back to front, but also proceeding from high down to low and then back up to high. Another piece of information that's on this chart that's helpful to know is if you want to think about the vowels and, and have a, a, a way to memorize the vowels as they proceed from back to front and from high to low and back up to high, you can think about the phrase, who would know aught of art must again learn and then take his ease. Who would know aught of art must again learn and then take his ease. Those are the orders of the vowels. Now let's look above the vowels that are laid out and look at the representations on the chart. The ovals represent the first formant of each of these vowels. The rectangles represent the second formant of each of these vowels. If you'll notice, these are not pinpricks. These represent a range of frequencies. So the frequency content of the first and second formant of each of these vowels is represented on this Y or vertical axis. We have a range of frequencies represented by F2 for U, a range of frequencies that are represented in F1 for U, and so on and so forth across the vowels, demonstrating the range of frequencies one might measure when you're measuring the acoustics of speakers. Now, as an aside, that is the reason when you look at the literature about the speech frequencies of different speech sounds. You might see in Dr. Ling's publications and other publications that frequencies are given for a speech sound, but there's a note that says this frequency tends to be the frequency of this sound plus or minus one octave 
plus or minus one octave, meaning that that's pretty much the range of frequencies. But we need to hang our hats on some sort of hook. So we're going to designate a frequency so that we have some place to start with for a particular speech sound and the components of a speech sound. But we know that in reality, that real frequency is going to shift with speaker and context. So let's look at F1 in general. And again, we're going to look, as we have on other graphs, we're going to look at how F1 changes with vowel height. And as we move from our high vowels, U, U, I, E, they have the lowest F1 frequency. And F1 frequency peaks at our low vowels and then diminishes. Now, you're probably taking note of the way we have the F1 frequency for um, uh and the, un the schwa, the unstressed uh and er. See how it lowers a little bit? In the dialect that this represents, and also um, in general, the uh, the schwa, the stressed and unstressed schwa, are um, in some dialects made with a little bit of lip rounding. And as we have said, that lowers all the formats, so they're lowered a little bit. And across dialects, the R colored vowel, er, tends to be made with lip rounding as well as the um, the tongue movement for the er. And so again, that lip rounding is affecting the formant here. But we can say in general that for F1, high vowels have a lower F1. Low vowels have a higher F1. Let's look at F2. The vowels on this chart are moving from back to front, from back to front, and we see the F2 range moving from lower in frequency to higher in frequency. But don't forget that F1 is lower in frequency than F2, and for our movement of F2, it's lower F2 for back vowels, and as we move through the mid-central vowels, and then to our front vowels, front vowels, F2 is higher in frequency. Now, what might happen if you can't hear F2 at all? What if you only had hearing through the range that would allow you to hear F1? Maybe hearing only up to a thousand hertz. That's hearing that might be the case in a youngster who has what we call a left corner audiogram. A youngster who audiometrically might be a candidate, is very likely to be a candidate for a cochlear implant. What is accessible to that youngster prior to obtaining the implant? Well, um, the first foreman is accessible. And if we can hear the first formant, we can hear the difference between high and low vowels. But there are some vowels that will sound alike because the first formant and these vowels are identical and differentiated only because we hear the second formant, at least differentiated auditorily. So our, our Prominent candidates for these sound alikes are E and U. Here we have an X on the first formant for U, and we have an X on the first formant for E, and they're just about at the same frequency position. They sound alike if the listener cannot access the second frequency. There's another pair of sound alikes, and that is the pair 
u and i. If the listener cannot access, cannot hear F2 or has not been taught to listen to F2, if it's very faint and doesn't have good solid auditory experience listening to that F2, um, these are also vowels that will sound alike because they're so identical in F1. The U and the I. So if only F1 is audible, some vowels will sound alike. The pairs that will sound alike are E and U and I and U. So let's just summarize. Knowing that when we talk about frequency information, it's going to vary with speaker. With regard to F1, F1 is sensitive to changes in jaw height. Remember that F1 is lower than F2 in frequency. It decreases as we move from low to high vowels. High vowels have lower F1, low vowels have higher F1. If you can hear F1, you can quite possibly identify vowel height, the difference between E and A, ah, the difference between U and A. Ah. You could discriminate. You could tell that they are different sounds. F1 ranges in frequency from 250 through 1,000 hertz. We tend to think of E and U as having a first formant or F1 at 250 hertz. And then F1 for pretty much most other vowels being at 500 hertz, 250 and 500 hertz. However, in some speakers, F1 can go as high as 1,000 hertz, but I put it in parentheses because we're going to retain, for our purposes, 250 and 500 hertz being our important frequency measures for F1. If we don't hear F2, F1 is identical for E and U and for I and U, and you may have some confusions. Now, with regard to the second formant, F2, second formant is sensitive to changes in the position of the tongue. It decreases from front to back vowels, meaning that F2 is higher for front vowels and F2 is lower for back vowels. If you can hear through 2000 hertz, it means that you can hear enough of F1 and F2 to identify all of the vowels. You can hear enough of all of the formant information such that we don't have those sound alikes. Hearing through 2000 hertz is particularly important for vowel identification. In general, the second formant ranges from 1000 to 3000 hertz. A way to think about this is that back vowels, for back vowels, the second formant is around 1,000 hertz, 1,000 hertz for back vowels. Central vowels, we might say the second formant is around 1,500 hertz. And for front, front vowels, the second formant is around 2,000 hertz, 1,000 hertz for back vowels. 1,500 hertz for central vowels, 2,000 hertz for front vowels. And using Dr. Ling's sentence, who would know, etc., you can think of that as a way for remembering which vowels are front, central, and back. One last comment about vowel production, and that has to do with diphthongs. And diphthongs are vowels that change as we produce a diphthong, we're moving our jaw up and down, and we're also moving our tongue forward or back. The vowels themselves, ordinary vowels, are what we call steady state. We just 
position our jaw and our tongue and produce the vowel. But that's not the case. That's not the case with diphthongs. The, our jaw and our tongue move when we're producing the diphthongs, and it is that movement that then creates formant movement that helps us identify. Oh, what I'm listening to is a diphthong. The formants shift when we look at the spectrogram and recognizing those formant shifts leads to the identification, the recognition of a diphthong. So let's just highlight those formant shifts so that we can we can illustrate this. So this is I and we'll just trace the first formant I and ow and oi. And we have here ah to i. I. We have moving from in our jaw position from a low jaw position to a high jaw position and we have a higher F1 for our low jaw position and a lower F1 to our high jaw position. Ow is the same kind of movement from low jaw position to high jaw position from high F1 to low F1 and oi is less clear on this spectrogram. So we're going to leave that one be for right now. Now let's look at F2. And we'll just give it a slightly different color. Here's I, Ow, Oi. With I, we're moving from a central vowel to a front vowel <clears throat> and so we have the um, movement from a lower F2 to a higher F2 because we, as we move from central to front we have the second formant going up. As we move from central to back we have the formant moving down because central vowels have a higher formant than back vowels. And as we move from a more central o to i, we have the formant, the second formant moving up as we move from more central to more front. Let's summarize what we've talked about with regard to the frequency of vowels and the frequencies that appear on the audiogram. So we're using the octave frequencies on the audiogram, but we're going to add for our purposes a mid-octave frequency, 1500 hertz, to help you think about the vowels. Now in our last lecture, <coughs> we talked about the fundamental frequency at 250 hertz, coding the supersegmentals. If you can hear 250 hertz, you can hear the supersegmentals. Now we're going to add some additional information with regard to vowels. F1 in vowels is encompassed in at 250 and 500 hertz. The F1, the first formant in U and E, is found at around 250 hertz. The other vowels, we'll say, is, are found around 500 hertz. And so this is F1, sensitive to changes in jaw height. Our highest vowel, E and U, at 250 hertz. And as we move down, as our jaw lowers, the first formant moves into the 500 hertz range. Now let's look at the front-back dimension of vowel production the tongue placement dimension of vowel production and we say that the second formant is sensitive to changes in tongue position and our range of 
frequencies represented for speech recognition of vowels, of vowels on the front back dimension goes from 1000 hertz to 2000 hertz, with 1000 hertz being the range of the second format for back vowels, F2 at 1000 hertz, central vowels in front back tongue position being around 1500 hertz, and then F2 for front vowels being around 2000 hertz. So for clear identification of all vowels using information with regard to vowel height and vowel place, hearing both F1 and F2, it's essential to have auditory access to speech at least through 2000 hertz. Our next topic coming up, consonants. And having a good understanding of resonance and how the jaw and the tongue change the first and second formant are an important foundation upon which to then expand to look at the complexity of jaw and tongue movement and how the tongue works and the lips work with the production of consonants. So we'll be expanding our knowledge and we'll also be adding timing as an aspect of consonant production and consonant speech acoustics. To review some information from the start of this lecture, if you would like copies of these slides, you can go to the link on this slide to Dropbox, and there are PDFs of these slides, or you can write me or you can also send questions and comments to Helen McMorrison at gmail.com. I welcome your comments and your questions. If you want to learn more about helping children with hearing loss in their families, I encourage you go I encourage you to go to the recipeslp.com website where we are building a series of ebooks titled Listening and Spoken Language Strategies for Young Children with Hearing Loss. Thank you for listening to this lecture, and have a good day.